If you were to walk through a data center, you will see many of these racks all together with a lot of different equipment installed in each one of them. All of these devices work together to be able to take data from one part of the network and move it to another part of the network. Each of these devices is installed for a specific reason, and it's helpful if we understand why we installed that particular piece of equipment to begin with. Over time, we may be installing more of this existing equipment into our racks, or we may be installing new technology. So in this video, we'll look at different types of devices and how we might use them in our data center. Let's start with one of the most common devices that you'll find, which is a router. A router allows us to take data on one IP subnet and route that information to a different IP subnet. These may be subnets that are next to each other in the same data center, or these IP subnets may be located in different parts of the world. We refer to a router as an OSI Layer 3 device. At the OSI Layer 3 or network layer, we're referring to IP addresses, and IP addresses is exactly what's used by a router to be able to determine the next hop for this information. You may sometimes see this routing functionality also included inside of an existing switch. And we often refer to these as layer three switches, which of course is referring to that OSI layer three functionality. It's not that the switch itself is now operating at a different OSI layer. It's just within that same piece of equipment, we have both a layer two switch and a layer three router. So we've abbreviated that as a layer three switch. These routers often connect many different types of networks. So we may be connecting a local area network or a LAN to a wide area network or a WAN. These might also be copper-based connections or fiber-based connections. So we may have routers with many different connections or interfaces on them, and we're connecting many different diverse networks to all of those different interfaces. Another common device is a network switch. Switches operate at the MAC address layer to be able to forward traffic. So we'll often refer to that as an OSI layer two or data link device. These operate mostly in hardware. The hardware inside of these devices is referred to as an ASIC. That is an application specific integrated circuit. There are many different functions and capabilities inside of these switches, especially if you're using one designed for the enterprise. For example, many of these switches have the ability to include power on the same wires as your ethernet connection. And we refer to that as power over ethernet or POE. And as we mentioned before, you may hear folks refer to this as a layer three switch if the switch includes some type of routing functionality built into the device itself. Security on our networks is also important. That's why you probably are using a firewall at home and you most certainly have a firewall in your office. A traditional firewall allows you to filter traffic based on a TCP or UDP port number. But if you have a more modern firewall, you're probably using a next generation firewall or NGFW, which is able to identify applications traversing your network and allow you to manage whether that application should be allowed or not allowed on your network. Most firewalls also have additional functionality. For example, it's common to find firewalls that will allow us to encrypt traffic traversing the network through a virtual private network or VPN. It's very common to have a firewall at one remote site and a firewall at another remote site and be able to create an encrypted tunnel between those firewalls using this VPN functionality. And most firewalls can also operate as a layer three device, which means the firewalls themselves can act as a router. That's because they are often sitting right between the ingress and egress point of your network, where all the traffic on the inside of your network is going to the outside or internet connection, and your internet traffic is coming inbound to your local network. We rely on the firewall to be able to manage the communication between the inside and the outside of the network. To be able to perform this functionality, many firewalls also provide network address translation, or NAT. And because they are a router, it's very common to have dynamic routing protocols supported inside of the firewall as well. 
Many data centers might also have standalone IDS or IPS devices, although much of that functionality is also integrated into the more modern next generation firewall. IDS refers to an intrusion detection system, and the IPS refers to an intrusion prevention system. Both of these work in similar ways. They're looking for attacks that are inbound to your network and are able to identify, alert, and in many cases, prevent that attack from gaining access to your network. These are commonly known attack types. These might be exploits against operating systems or the applications that you're using, and they might take advantage of known vulnerabilities with those applications or systems by taking advantage of a buffer overflow, a cross-site scripting vulnerability, or other known vulnerabilities to those systems. If you're using an intrusion detection system, it's able to alarm or alert if it ever sees any of these inbound attacks. If you're using an intrusion prevention system, it's able to go a step further and block that particular attack before it gets inside of your network. Since an intrusion detection system is not able to block that traffic, it's very common to see an intrusion prevention system used on our enterprise networks. If you've ever used a website that may be accessed by millions of people every day, you may be wondering how that site is able to remain up and running without any type of downtime. In most cases, it's because that site is using a load balancer to be able to distribute that load across multiple physical servers. As the end user, you may have no idea that this load balancing is taking place. But if you were to look at the data center for this organization, you might find a large number of web servers servers or database servers in farms that can be used in conjunction with this load balancer to maintain uptime and availability. These load balancers are also very good at identifying any outages to these servers. So if one of the servers happens to fail due to a hardware error or some type of software problem, the load balancer can recognize the issue, take that server out of the rotation, and continue to provide access to these services using the remaining devices that are connected to the load balancer. Here's a common design for a load balancer where users on the internet would be accessing a service at a location. To the end user's perspective, they're accessing a single server, but they're really accessing a load balancer that is distributing that load between multiple servers inside of that company's data center. These load balancers can also optimize the communication. For example, it may perform TCP offloading so that the communication to all of these servers on the inside of the network are occurring as quickly as possible. These load balancers can also act as an SSL offload, which means that they will provide the encryption and decryption capabilities instead of having the servers themselves manage that process. Data might also be cached on the load balancer, so requests made to the load balancer can be answered immediately instead of going all the way down to the server to provide that data. And load balancers are also very good at prioritizing different types of traffic over others. There might be certain web pages that have higher access than others, and you can commonly perform that prioritization using quality of service or QoS. Load balancers can also provide application-centric load balancing where certain pages may be located on certain servers and all of the requests to those pages would go exclusively to those individual servers. Many organizations have security concerns about individual users being able to directly communicate with a server or service that's on the internet. One of the ways that the organization can manage these connections is by putting a device in the middle of this conversation called a proxy. This proxy is responsible for taking the user's request, performing that request on their behalf, receiving the answer to that request, verifying that the answer doesn't contain some type of malicious software or malicious code, and then providing that answer to the end user. That is the purpose of a proxy to sit in the middle of the communication and make that communication on the user's behalf. Since the proxy is sitting in the middle of the conversation, it's a perfect place to do caching. So the user can make a request to a web server. If that request has already been cached by the proxy server, the answer can go right back to the user without having to access the internet. We might also provide access control from the proxy server so that we can request a username and password from the user in order to gain access to the internet. From that point, we might want to filter URLs or perform some type of content scanning to make sure that the user is not receiving any type of malicious software.
Some proxies require you to configure the operating system or the applications that you're using to identify the proxy and be able to use that to send and receive communication. But not all proxies work in that explicit manner. There are also transparent proxies that will work invisibly without making any changes to the operating system or the applications in use. It's very common to store documents and other files on centralized storage facilities inside of our data centers. One type of storage is referred to as a network attached storage or NAS. We often refer to this network attached storage as providing file level access. That means that if we wanted to gain access to information within a file, we need to pull the entire file across the network into the memory of our system. And when we're writing information or changing information in that file, we will need to write the entire file back to the NAS. A more efficient way of communication might be through the use of a storage area network, or a SAN. This is very similar to reading and writing information from a local storage drive, where instead of copying the entire file to be able to change just a bit of information within it, we have block level access, which means that we can change just the blocks that have been modified. And when you have very large files, this can be a very efficient way to modify just a little bit of information within that very large document. Whether you're using a NAS or a SAN, you're probably transferring a lot of files to these systems. And for that reason, we want to be sure that we're using the most efficient method of communication. It's very common, for example, to put the NAS or the SAN on its own isolated network. And it's commonly a network that has very high bandwidths. If you're in your office and you look at the ceiling, you might see a device like this. This is an access point. This device allows us to communicate wirelessly from our device to the rest of the network. This is not the wireless router that you might be using at home, which is a router and a wireless access point and a switch in the same device. When you're in larger enterprise environments, you're usually using a device that is purpose built for a single function. And having an access point means that we're using this for wireless communication and wireless communication only. On the other side of this wireless access point is very commonly an Ethernet connection. So this is bridging communication between the wireless network and the wired Ethernet network. That's why we refer to access points as an OSI Layer 2 device or a data link layer device, because it's making that translation between the 802.11 wireless network and the 802.3 Ethernet network. In most businesses of any size, you probably have more than one access point. That's because you probably have a very large building or series of buildings, and you need to be sure that everyone is able to access that wireless network wherever they happen to be inside of these buildings. But this means that we have to manage many different wireless access points wherever they might be in our local network or in a remote site network. And we might need to manage security settings, access policies, and other configuration parameters within that access point. We also have users that may be very mobile and moving between different parts of the building or moving from one building to the other. And we need to make sure that they can seamlessly roam from one access point to the other so that they are always connected to the network. Instead of connecting to each individual access point to make these configuration changes or manage this process, we can have a centralized management tool that allows us to manage all of our access points from one central place. This is a wireless LAN controller, and it gives us that single pane of glass so that we can manage the entire infrastructure while we're sitting in one chair. From this single device, we can deploy new access points with a full configuration. We might want to set up performance or security monitoring and be alerted if we happen to see anything across any of our access points. We can also take any changes that we need to make and deploy those automatically to all of our access points with one click of the mouse. This also allows us very commonly to create reports on how much our access points are being used and be able to understand if we need to update or change any of our our access point locations. These are often proprietary systems. So if we have an access point from one particular manufacturer, then we're also using the wireless LAN controller that is also from that same manufacturer. 